Good morning. It's good to see you all out this morning, and uh, we appreciate your presence. And if you're joining us virtually, we thank you for attending as well. As we begin our song service, let's uh, notice number 61 in our hymn book, and the words will be displayed up here on the screen as well. Number 61. <clears throat> Blessed assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. Heir of salvation, purchase of God, born in his spirit, washed in his blood. This is my story, this is my song, praising my Savior.
Thank you, Mark, for leading us in that beautiful song. Yesterday, uh, we want to keep uh, Patty Ratchford uh, in, our, in our family in our prayers. Uh, her father passed away. I also want to keep all those on our prayer list in our prayers. And it's good to see Marta Cannon here with us. Let's go to our Heavenly Father. Dear Lord, we come before you. Thank you so much for all that many blessings and most of all for your son, Jesus. Father, at this time we come before you asking your blessings upon those in our prayer list, Father, that be their will, you restore the health and strength to them and, and, and be with their families and comfort and strength for them. Father, also pray that you be with Patty and Rachel and her family and that you comfort them, Father, the loss of their, their father. And Lord, pray that all those that I remember who've lost loved ones recently, that you comfort them. And Father, I pray that you be with our military personnel that are serving all the world, especially those that are in harm's way. And Father, pray that you be with our missionaries, that you'll protect them, Father, as they go about spreading your word about your son, Jesus, Father, and the message of salvation. And Father, I pray that be of all in number of traveling that you return safely to us. And Father, we pray that for peace, Father, that uh, in, our, in our world, Father, especially in the Ukraine. And Father, we pray that you be of the storm, this, this hour of worship, that be of the men there be leaves in this worship service, Father. In the name, in the name of the Son, Jesus Christ, we ask this prayer. Amen. As we prepare to share in the Lord's Supper together, let's join in singing number 136. Number 136. <clears throat> Up Calvary's mountain, one dreadful morn, walk across my sin. See you. 
Does anyone need a communion set? Okay. If you'd like to follow along, I'll start in the 11th chapter of the book of Hebrews this morning. <clears throat> Hebrews 11 and verse 13 it's recorded for us, these all died in faith, not having received the promise, but having seen them afar off, were assured of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrim on this earth. For those who say such things declare plainly that they seek a homeland, and truly if they had been called to mind to that country from which they had come out, they would have an opportunity to return. But now they desire a better, that is a heavenly country. Therefore God is not ashamed to be their called God because he has prepared for them a city. As we pause for a few moments this morning to remember, we often focus on the crucifixion. We focus on the sacrifice that Jesus made for us and truly it's what we are here to do. We also focus on what awaits us because of that sacrifice. But something far better than this world waits for us. Those who follow the news, uh, all of us are aware of what is happening in the nation of Ukraine right now. That another country just decided to enforce their will by military strength. And it's horrible to think of these people living through this time and the destruction that's happening and the death that's happening and to get caught up in those events. But we have to keep in mind that we are here to look for something far greater than this world has to offer. That we have full assurance that something far greater is waiting on us. Paul would write to the church in Corinth in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. He quotes Isaiah here. But it is written, An eye has not seen, nor have they heard, nor have they entered into the heart of the man, the things which God had prepared for those who love him. But God has revealed them to us through his Spirit, for the Spirit searches all things, yes, the deep things of God. Our mind cannot truly grasp what awaits us, how magnificent an eternity in heaven will be. But it was made possible through a horrific sacrifice of Jesus that he came to this earth and he gave himself. On the night he was betrayed, remember what he told his disciples, I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come and gather you unto myself, so where I am, there you may be also. We're here this morning to pause for a few moments to remember that great sacrifice that was made for us, but to also remember that something far better than the cares and concerns of this world await for us if we are faithful and obedient to him. Let's go to God in prayer together. Our God and our Father in heaven, we are mindful of your Son as we pause for a few moments this morning together as a family of believers. That many throughout the world today have come together to remember the great sacrifice that your Son made. That he truly went to that cross as the perfect Lamb of God, without any spot, without any blemish. That he willingly gave himself for the sins of this world. That his body was beaten, that it was nailed to a cross, that it hung there and it died for us. We were also mindful that that body came from the grave three days later, that it rose to show your power over death, and that it ascended, and he sits at your right hand and reigns as the King of kings and the Lord of lords. As we pause for a few moments this morning, help us to remember truly 
the great love that was involved in that sacrifice and to remember what waits for us that is something far better than this world has to offer. It's in your son Jesus' name I pray. Amen. Continue our thanks. Our God and our Father in heaven, as we continue our time together this morning, remembering your Son, remembering your love, we're mindful of this fruit of the vine that your Son said would represent his blood that is shed for many. Truly, your blood, his blood was shed for the remission of sins, and we're thankful that. 2,000 years later, that blood still provides forgiveness of our sins. And if we're faithful and obedient, we know that something far better than this world waits for us because your son made the ultimate sacrifice for us. We ask that you would bless these emblems to our spiritual nourishment. In your son, Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <clears throat> remind the church in 1 Corinthians 11 that so long as we partake of this bread and the fruit of the vine we show forth the Lord's death until he comes again and if it does not come again during this week Lord willing we will be here again next week to remember once again the sacrifice we always take this time to be mindful also of the blessings that we have been given as we said truly we're blessed in this world far greater than many people. We've just been asked to give back cheerfully and as we have been prospered. There's a box in the back corner for you to make an offering to support the work of the church throughout the world. Let's offer thanks for the blessings we have. <clears throat> Our dear Heavenly Father, we look around us so many times in this world and we see things that we don't have and we're in a society where we're constantly bombarded with advertisements about how to improve our life and we lose sight of how blessed we truly and fortunate we truly are. We pray that we would truly focus on the things that you have blessed us with to be mindful that you have promised to provide for every one of our needs Maybe not every one of our wants, but you truly provide for the needs that we have in this world and help us to learn to be content with being provided for the way that you have given to us. As we pause for a few moments this morning, we pray that we would return a portion to you cheerfully and that it would be used to further your work throughout this community and throughout the world. In your son Jesus' name I pray. Amen. <clears throat> Song of encouragement after the lesson will be number 600. Number 600. And before the lesson, let's notice number 645. Number 645. Shall we stand together? <clears throat> Jesus says, last night long, he's through his blood. 
don't think I've ever heard that song. That is great. It was a great song. Uh, reading this morning from Luke chapter 1, verses 13 through 19. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your prayer is heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John, and you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. For he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and shall drink neither wine nor strong drink. He will also be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God." He will also get, go before him uh, in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the father to the children and, to, and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for people uh, prepared for the Lord. And Zacharias said to the angel, how shall I know this? For I am an old man and my wife is well advanced in years. And the angel said, answered and said to him, I am Gabriel who stands in the presence of God and was sent to speak to you and bring you these glad tidings. Thank you, Richard. This is another part of the series where we want to get to know Jesus. And the elders purchased this program this year to help us get to know Jesus and tell others. I'd like to welcome everyone here today. We've got a very good group with us. Appreciate that. Some of you may know this story. We're going to dwell in Luke chapter 1 today. And uh, we're going to cover the whole chapter. But uh, we won't be here all day doing that. We'll skim through it. But what we want to be able to do is be able to tell others about the hope that resides within us. We're looking at an area where Luke is going to talk about the good news and the tidings of things that have happened. He is going to write to Theophilus about past things that went on and to carry about the great news throughout this area of Samaria, Judea, Galilee. In the first hour, we're looking into Isaiah, where Isaiah predicts the destruction of the people of Israel, their loss of hope, and now hope is returned. And hope is returned to us, too. And some of the things we've just talked about, we'll talk about in the end here today, how short our life is. And we're going to see today how God gives us an opening, a portal to the future that we don't have to worry about the temporal things in this life. As Michael talked about, as the forces are coming in on people now and we need to pray for those people in Ukraine. They have no hope left, but God always provides us hope. Luke starts out his introduction here in Luke chapter 1. For much as many have taken in the hand to draw up a narrative concerning those matters which have been fulfilled among us, even as they've delivered them to us, from the beginning were eyewitnesses and ministers of the word. It seems good to me, he says, that also I've traced the course of things accurately and first write unto you, most excellent Theopolis, that thou mightst knowest the things certainly concerning the things which were now instructed. Luke begins this four-phrase preface with an announcement to this book. And if you look in the introduction of Acts, he says the same thing. Regarding what I wrote to you earlier, he's regarding a writing about this letter here. It's one long sentence in the Greek, and we're going to mark about this again. This is a book that was written to the Greeks. These were people that were learned at the time in history, and he is going to organize his thoughts so Theopolis might understand about this Jesus. It's come. 
This dedication in here is a time in the first century where the basic bodies of beliefs were available to the church. He remarks about eyewitnesses to these accounts. Remember, there was eyewitnesses to God in the flesh, eyewitnesses to the miracles, the teachings that he developed, the understanding of a kingdom. They're not sure exactly who Theopolis was, but he seems to be of high standings. And his name is lover of God. That's what it means in the Greek. Lover of God. And Luke's going to tell about a great event where an, where an angel from God, as Rick, Richard wrote, uh, read about, Gabriel comes to Zacharias, the priest. And we're going to look into that story today and quickly end up with where the announcement is also made to Mary, who would eventually give birth to the child, Jesus. Theopolis was thought to be a Syrian ruler, but he loved God, as we just remarked about. He apparently was looking into the scriptures. He was searching for God. And so that's an application for us. If we search for God, if we look for God in this life, he will answer. He will seek you out as you seek him. Luke's going to talk about all the prophecies that Jesus fulfilled that were written by the prophets in the Old Testament. In fact, we're going to capture one from Isaiah today. He's going to also portray through this book, as we get to know Jesus, how Jesus fulfilled all of God's righteousness. In other words, he did what was right in the eyes of God, including being baptized by John the Baptizer, who Zacharias would give birth to through his wife, Elizabeth. And we're going to look into that again today. These things are some, some of you here know about these things. Others here, it might be the first time. We can all learn from them. We can all tell others. Luke informs us of a God that uses divine intervention to set the courses for things that we see today that gives us the hope that we live in today. <clears throat> we talk about lineage. We looked in this a couple of weeks ago. Luke in chapter 3 is going to go into a lineage of where Jesus comes from. John talks about a lineage. I mean, John doesn't talk about a lineage. Matthew does. And Matthew's lineage is focused on Jesus as the Messiah, the promised one through the prophets, the Jews, and what they taught about. All the way back to Abraham. Luke's going to take us all the way back to the beginning in his lineage in chapter 3. As we remarked a few weeks ago, Luke's account of lineage is a little different than Matthew's. As Matthew's lineage is written to the Jew, and if you look into that in Matthew, you'll see that he provides a lineage all the way back to David. King David wasn't as important to the Greeks that would read this letter from Luke, though. But Luke provides lineage all the way back to Abraham. John's introduction develops the idea that Jesus always was. And if one of the things we notice in the Bible, in the New Testament, is that we really don't celebrate the birth of Jesus. We celebrate his death and resurrection, which we just took part of a moment ago. But we don't really see celebration or observance of Jesus' birth. And although Luke is the only account that gives us some of these 
ideas of how he was come about through divine intervention by God, Jesus always was. And in John, we see this, is Jesus is eternal. His words are eternal. John tells us that he is the light and the darkness that shines through this world. And John describes him in several ways as the creator. John describes Jesus as God. John describes Jesus as the life. He is the light. <clears throat> he is flesh, that is man, John 1.14. He is begotten from the Father. He is the provider of grace and truth. And he is God, the Father, manifested in the flesh. So as we look at the different Gospels, the four Gospels, they all paint a different picture of Jesus. And as a review, that is important for us to remember that depending on your perspective, you can gain things from these four Gospels that enlighten us into the divine inter intervention that God gave when he provided us his son. Again, Matthew wrote to the Jews, and Luke here today writes to the Gentile. In Luke chapter 1, 5 through 10, <clears throat> Luke describes a scene where Herod was the king, and Zacharias is a priest, and he's from the lineage of Aaron, the royal priesthood. And notice that Zechariah did all things also before God righteously. And he tried to follow the ordinances. And it says here that he was blameless in verse 6. And he had taken part in the temple ritual of burning incense within the temple. He had taken a lot, and his lot was this week, and he was burning incense. Some of the key points is Zacharias lived southwest of the city of Jerusalem. He was a priest. His wife, Elizabeth, and he were both descendants of Aaron, the royal priesthood. Zacharias was a division of Abiah, and these priests were divided into 24 divisions. And they took turns ministering to the temple. And by lot, by casting straws, you might say, it was Zacharias' turn as he was in the temple, Luke 1.9. This was one of the most prized tasks of the priest, to be before the most holy of places. He was on one side of the veil of the curtain, burning incense. As the people outside were praying, they knew he was in there doing this. He wasn't inside the Holy of Holies. That was only once a year, but he was outside burning incense. And we're going to see here that as he's performing this task, Gabriel, the angel, appears for one purpose, to quote scriptures and to tell Zechariah he would now be an important part as his son would blaze the trail to tell others about Jesus. There's only one other angel here mentioned by name, and that's Michael in the Bible. And we're going to see where Zacharias struggles in belief. Elizabeth and Mary also question some things. And this is all given so that Theopolis might understand that Jesus is now going to take over for the law of Moses. And although these people in this point in time are still working under the law of Moses, the Old Testament, the Old Covenant, this question is often asked, when Jesus was on the cross, why did he say this to this thief, today you'll be with me in paradise? Why wasn't he baptized? Well, they were still under the Old Testament system. And as this is going on right here, Zacharias is performing these tasks under the Old Testament system. 
People are out in the courtyard praying as he's performing this task of burning incense and praying to God that he might forgive him them of their sins. And so this is what is going on in these first five verses. He's praying, he's burning incense. And what's about to happen? One of these prophecies is going to be fulfilled. In this chapter, behold, I'm going to give you a sign. A virgin shall conceive a son, and his name shall be Emmanuel. And also Micaiah, Malachi, verses chap, or chapter 4, 5, and 6. Behold, I will send you Elijah, the prophet, before the great and terrible day of Jehovah to come. And he shall turn the hearts of the fathers to the children, and the heart of the children to the fathers. And this is what's coming as this chapter is a prelude to John the Baptist fulfilling Malachi, as John would be thought of as this prophet, Elijah. In Luke chapter 11, 1 through 15, here we see this angel appearing before Zacharias. And Zacharias, imagine seeing this angel, had fear fall upon him. He probably thought at that moment he might be breathing his last breath as this was a very fearful thing to go in to the holy area. And the the angel goes ahead and tells Zacharias that Elizabeth, his wife, shall bear a son. And they'll call his name John. And that birth will give joy and gladness and then one of the marks that he will drink no strong, strong drink. And he shall be filled, as, as I was read earlier, with the Holy Spirit. In other words, he would be able to speak the words that God would want him to speak. Moving on in Luke chapter 1, 26 through 33, we see that Gabriel is now sent to Galilee named Nazareth to a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph and he notice is from the house of David and of course this virgin's name was Mary we don't know what time of the year this happened it doesn't tell us to God it's not important what's important is the message that God through divine intervention is bringing us a new covenant, a new promise, a new plan for us to one day be with him for eternity. Isn't that why we're here this morning? Is to be with God someday in eternity. We never can lose sight. We can't take our eyes off the goal and the prize. And his name shall be called Jesus. And we're going to remark on that in a moment. And he shall be great. He will be called the Son of the Most High. And the Lord God shall give him the throne of his father David. These are spiritual metaphors here. For we can never understand totally spiritual realm. But as we know in the book of Hebrews that Jesus now reigns with God on the right hand of his throne. Luke chapter 1, 26 through 38, that we just quickly looked through some of it. Mary and Joseph both lived at this time in Nazareth. And Mary was engaged to Joseph. It was called a betrothal. Legally bound, this engagement was a legal agreement. It wasn't to be broke off. The angel told Mary that the name of the son that she would give would be Jesus in the Greek, Joshua in the Hebrew. 
So Jesus from the Hebrew vernacular would be called Joshua. Something to remember. You can say the name Joshua, but it would be the Greek, I mean the Hebrew rendering of the Greek Jesus. Meaning Jehovah saves. And Mary knew this would happen. She trusted in God. Remember in the story, Zacharias and Elizabeth sort of doubted this would happen. But she wondered. In Luke chapter 1, 34 through 35, she wonders how this would happen. As she was a virgin, and this again was a virgin birth, it was beyond her comprehension to understand. Mary arose in chapter 39 through 45. She rose in those days and went to the hill country with haste into the city of Judea. And she entered into the house of Zacharias and Elizabeth gave her a salutation. Hello, we might say today. And it came to pass as Elizabeth heard the salutation of Mary, the babe leapt in her womb. And Elizabeth is now filled miraculously with the Holy Ghost. If you watched in search of the Lord's way this morning, and I appreciate Nancy and Sally putting what is coming in the search of the Lord's way. Uh, my grandmother watched that show religiously when she was alive. In fact, that closing song was her favorite song. But today was on the sanctity of life. Even though if we might have made mistakes in the past, we can be forgiven. But he made the point that who has the authority to give and take lives? It's only God. And we need to remember that. So this babe was in the womb. It wasn't a fetus, it was a baby. And it leapt as Mary entered the womb. And my, Mary says in verse 46, My soul magnifies the Lord. My spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. For he hath regarded my low estate. In other words, we might say, I am nobody. I am nothing. Notice the humility there. In all the generations, he has called me blessed. He's been shown, he's shown favor on her. And she's remarking about her lineage, which we just briefly <coughs> talked about. And all the mighty things that he has done, the great things he has done in his holy name. And his mercy has been on us. Those who respect him, the word here is fear, from generation to generation. Those that are proud in their own hearts, he is scattered, she says. Notice she's saying this as she's filled with the Holy Spirit. God scatters the proud and lifts up the humble. And he has put down their mighty seats, and we talked about that as we study Isaiah. How God says, I've raised these kings up and I will bring them down. And that's something for us to remember, even though times seem bleak, we need to remember who's in charge. He's filled the hungry with the good things and the rich he sent away empty. And he's spoken to his servant Israel. Remember my mercies, which he's saying. Mary traveled some eight, 70 to 80 miles, it said, to visit Elizabeth. I might be going to Omaha in about a month. Omaha is about 120 miles from here. To give you some idea of distance. Or maybe it's closer to Topeka from here. Actually, Topeka is a little shorter than that, isn't it? That's quite a distance to be traveling. 
Gabriel mentions that he'd visit Elizabeth. Elizabeth praises Mary and think of that reunion. And Mary praises God. And it said that Mary stayed in Judea for three months. And she must have left answering many questions about this virgin birth that was coming. And notice here are the things that we've already talked about. God chose Mary. Why? We might ask. Maybe it was her mind. She questioned things. She thought about things that Gabriel had said to her. She was noted as a godly woman, humble, and she found favor with God. She believed in God. She believed in his power. And she did not question his power. And there's a little bit of a converse there between what Zacharias and Elizabeth thought and what Mary thought. She was humble in spirit. And she herself was a bondservant, which we will later be called by Paul, bondservants to Christ. And she was submissive to the will of God. She knew her scriptures. She knew her Old Testament. She was brave and courageous. This would have been a terrible time to be betrothed with child and not be married. But she was brave. She knew God would provide. And Joseph was brave too. And he was willing to accept responsibility. And we do not read of much of Joseph during Jesus' ministry. And it's thought that maybe G Joseph he actually died after this. But we see Mary carrying on with her parental responsibilities all the way up to the cross. And we notice here later on in John, she expresses confidence in her son at the wedding feast of Canaan where Jesus performed his first miracle turning the water into wine. In Acts chapter 15, 15 through 19, Paul and Barnabas come back to Jerusalem and they converse over Jesus. And it is said there, and to this we agree to the words of the prophets. After these things I will return and build again the tabernacle of David which was fallen. And I will build against the ruins thereof, and I will set it up. And the residue of men may seek after the Lord, and all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who maketh these things known from old. Wherefore my judgments is that we trouble them not, them that are among the Gentiles, that also turned to God. And this dovetails with what Luke is saying here. He's going to tell Theopolis all about the prophets and how they told about a time where God would build his temple again. But this would be a spiritual temple, a tabernacle that was fallen. Amos chapter 9, verse 11. Some look for a physical tabernacle today. It's us. We are his tabernacle. We are here today as the church. And the remnant, those that are faithful and look to God, are the ones that God will spare from his wrath. To summarize, deity took upon flesh. Jesus, like Melchizedek, which we read about in Genesis and Hebrews, had no father. And Luke in his genealogy traces Mary back. Notice that in chapter 3. She traces the lineage of Mary because Jesus really had no father except for the heavenly father. Gabriel appears to Mary who descended through Judah, the line of Judah and David, and Gabriel calls Elizabeth Mary's cousin, not far removed from her, 51 generations, 
And Elizabeth is a tribe of Levi, is from the tri tribe of a Levi, who were the only ones, if I could say that right, who could perform the tasks of sacrifice. So two great lines come together, but God scatters and disposes of the proud. But he exalts the humble and their place, written from a book called Viewpoints, which is in our library. And the Messiah Jesus arises as the horn of salvation. I'm sure you're all surprised we're finished. Mark? <laughs> but the invitation still arises. There's some here that maybe never answered the call and submitted themselves to God. Through Jesus Christ, we have a plan of redemption and salvation that speaks to eternity. If you're here this morning, you've never believed, confessed that Jesus is the Son of God, said that you're willing to repent of your sins, why not today? Or if you're here for another reason that we might be able to assist you, elders can pray for you. This is the most loving church I've ever seen. We're here for you. If there's anything we do, let's come together now as we stand, as we sing the song that's been mentioned for an invitation. Would you live for Jesus and be always pure and good? Would you walk with him? somebody who is uh, uh, sincere and uh, I don't know, put things just puts things together where it's easy to understand and I do appreciate that. I have one final thing. You cannot watch the news without hearing about Russia invading Ukraine. Another start to another war. There have been a, a more than 100 wars in recorded history. Most have happened because one country wants what another country has, land, resources, access, etc. And they want it so badly they're willing to kill for it. Well, you know what? I think it's time for another war. We as Christians have what so much of the world needs, but there's no need for bloodshed. Jesus did that for us. And no one need take it from us for we will gladly give it away because giving it away does not mean we don't still possess it. That treasure is that the one died for is the grace of God, the hope of salvation and love that never fades. Thank you, Rick, for those words. And our closing prayer, I'll lead you in. We have a couple things we want to remember, of course, and uh, Danny Storms has been admitted to the VA hospital in Topeka. We want to remember him. He's had uh, some health issues for the last uh, few months, so they're observing him and sorting out his issues. Uh, Patty's father passed away. We remember them. Our condolences to the family. There's always sad times uh, that we see. 
We have some other people too. We had uh, heard yesterday that Monica Gray, she's now living in Texas. She's been diagnosed with uh, ovarian cancer. So we want to remember her in our prayers also. Uh, there's always someone and everything. It's good to see Marty here today with you guys getting around. It's still a struggle we know and we want to remember each other. Our prayer list, of course, is always there, and we want to remember everyone uh, that we have on that. So read down our prayer list, because we need uh, need all the prayers we can. Uh, yes? We need to pray for a bulletin assistant, too. We need somebody to help us with a bulletin. Yeah, someone we need to help with the bulletin kind of thing. We need a little assistance there. I'm sorry, you're going to have to speak up. Could you announce that we need somebody to help us with? Yeah, that's what I was talking about, yeah. Help with the bulletin. Nancy needs help there, volunteer, all right? So anybody who can give her a hand, she needs that. She, uh, she needs a little break from that, so give her a hand with those things onto it. I want to thank Sally for all the work she's done there also with the bulletin that we have. There's so many things that we need to pray for, and we have to remember all these things and there. And, uh, of course, our world peace, uh, the Ukraine and what we've seen happen. And uh, we know that we have had contact with the uh, Christians in Ukraine uh, over the years, so we want to remember them greatly. Let's go to our Father in prayer. Father and Father, we do thank you that we can come before you always. And Heavenly Father, these things we've mentioned, we bring before your throne, because we know, Heavenly Father, this world is yours and you have control over all of it, no matter what man does. Be with us, Heavenly Father, as we can do our part. We know that a journey starts with simply one step, and that's what we're here for. And those people we've mentioned, Heavenly Father, Danny, that remember him and his healing. Monica, Heavenly Father, we pray for her situation, her healing there. And Heavenly Father, for Patty and her family at this time of loss. We have many always, Heavenly Father, in our minds. Sometimes they're not listed here, but we remember them. We ask that you be with them and comfort them and give them the needs that they have. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the blessings of the works that we can do here. The food pantry that we try to run, the homeless shelter, Heavenly Father, the classes we teach, and gathering together in fellowship, Heavenly Father, we thank you for these blessings. We have new Christians, Heavenly Father, that we know, and Sherry's here this morning, and we praise you for that gift. We have those who are traveling, such as James, be with him, and he comes back to us safe. And we have those who are away from us, Heavenly Father, our families that we know, and we pray that you keep them safe and until the time we gather together. This day, Heavenly Father, we thank you and praise your name that you allowed us to get together here in fellowship in your name. That we might share these things of your gospel, that we have love for one another, that we might greet each other, Heavenly Father, knowing that we are here to share that gospel with anyone who asks. Be with us this day. Bring us, Heavenly Father, to the next appointed time that we might guide others and to strength, give strength to all of us as we endure in that fellowship. Pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We are dismissed.